Remind me, whose genius idea was it to airdrop us into a blizzard without a vehicle? Look, the package that we're supposed to recover emits an EMP pulse roughly 30 miles wide. The chopper can't get that close, and if we deployed in a vehicle, it would get knocked out instantly. Really? I have no idea. Take it up with management when we get back. If we get back. Great. Now I gotta spend the night in this lousy tent which I'm pretty sure has a hole in it. And we still got another 15 miles to hike. This is rubbish. Well, think about it this way. This will give us a chance to bond and discuss some deep, soul-searching topics. Such as, why are we here? Is there a greater purpose for our existence other than doing the dirty work of a mysterious corporation? We talk about that all the time back at the lab. In fact, that's all you talk about. Fine, okay. Since you're being Mr. Picky, why don't you give us a topic? Well, you know what? I will. Let's discuss some movies. I just watched Audition for the first time. It's pretty good. Have you seen it? I haven't. But I did just recently watch Morbius. Uh, and, and your outfit is great too. It almost looks like a Gucci outfit. <laughs> uh, uh, what I meant to say was we should talk about games, yes. Uh, what have you been playing recently? Uh, well, I did just finish The Red Lantern. You know, a game that takes place in Alaska. Now that I think about it, maybe we shouldn't talk about it. Do you have those moments that just stick out in your mind? Those ones that just stay with you forever. When I was a kid, I was told, you are what you do. So choose wisely. Okay, let's get this show on the road. Mush. So The Red Lantern is a survival roguelite game and also indie developer Timberland Studios' debut title. It was originally released on the Nintendo Switch and Epic Game Store in 2020, before being dropped onto Steam with little to no fanfare a year later. I hadn't even heard of this game until a friend of mine bought it for me during the 2021 Steam Winter Sale. Scanning the store page and user review section indicated that I was not alone, as the game only had around 20 reviews at the time. Most of the reviews are positive though, suggesting that this could potentially be a hidden gem that deserves more exposure. Only one way to find out, I guess. Taking place in the frigid state of Alaska, you play as an unnamed protagonist voiced by Ashley Birch, who you'll most likely know as Chloe from Life is Strange. After several failed attempts to pursue a career in the medical field, our protagonist sets out for the Alaskan cold, leaving the hustle and bustle of San Francisco behind. Accompanied by her canine, squirrel-loving companion named Chomper, she seeks out a new life as a sled dog racer, since that was her dream job as a child. Margot, a friend of the family and former sled dog racer, has given the protagonist a map to her old cabin, which is where she used to train her team before each race. After assembling a sled dog team of her own, our protagonist must successfully navigate the dangerous, frozen wilderness and reach Margot's cabin, which is marked by a red lantern hanging near the door. As always, let's start with the game's presentation. Instead of going for a realistic look, the Red Lantern presents us with a stylized depiction of the Alaskan wilderness. And to be honest, it works. It's not the most detailed game in the world, but its art style is appealing in the same way as the Borderlands series, where it's more focused on making the shapes and colors pop out. That's not to say that it lacks detail in the places where it matters, though. As you trudge through forests, cross frozen lakes, and speed through snowy fields, you'll be treated to some stunning views of the Alaskan skyline. Seriously, just look at that sunset. It's mesmerizing. Traveling at night is even better, as there is a good chance that you'll catch a glimpse of the magnificent Northern Lights, aka the Aurora Borealis. No, I'm not playing that clip. That meme has been dead for- Yes, I should be- Good lord, what is happening in there? Aurora Borealis? I the painting-like nature of the skyboxes matches the game's colorful presentation, making for one beautiful, atmospheric journey through the cold. There is also just something relaxing about sitting back and watching your dogs pull the sled, barking excitedly as they take sharp turns. It certainly makes for a good screensaver. On that note, let's move on to the stars of the game, the dogs. You can tell this is where most of the effort went into. After all, it is the game's selling point. To give credit where it's due, the developers have done an excellent job of ensuring that all of the dogs' unique personalities come across in their animations. Gale and Finn are the two standouts for me, 
Gale's overly enthusiastic energy is present in every interaction with her. You look like a force to be reckoned with. Gale, is it? I don't think you'll be needing much motivation. Even when you set up camp to rest, she's still rolling around on the ground with her tongue hanging out and eyes wide open. Finn, on the other hand, is shy, awkward, and anxious. You know that image of the dog in the plaid shirt with the caption, I am uncomfortable? That's Finn in a nutshell. When you recruit her, she just stares at you for the entire ride. And at camp, she never relaxes, sitting bolt upright while everyone else is resting on the ground. She doesn't like being pet either. Well, not the start anyway. Okay, well, that's pretty good. Maybe we'll get to a pet eventually, but I will accept a cautious sniff. Even for somebody as dead on the inside as I am, I found all of the dog's quirks and mannerisms endearing, and I think it would be hard for somebody to not get invested in the team they've assembled. And that's saying something. The devs could have just copied and pasted the same husky model and called it a day, and I'm glad they didn't. The care and effort put into each dog's personality helps give the game some much-needed character. Not only that, but their quirks also have an effect on the gameplay, which brings me to- Now hang on a minute, I heard you mention petting earlier. Tell me, can you pet the dogs in this game? Can you? You'd better answer quickly, cause I'm hovering my cursor over the buy button. Yes. Yes you can. But you should probably stick around and listen to the- Well I'm sold! I'm sure this has heightened your interest in the game, but why don't you stick around and find out if the gameplay is actually any good first before speeding off. Now let's talk about that. I mentioned at the beginning of this review that the Red Lantern is a survival roguelite, but what type of survival roguelite? Well, I'll keep it simple. It's the Oregon Trail, or if you're cultured, the Oregon Trail. If you're familiar with the structure of those games, you'll know exactly what to expect from the Red Lantern, i.e. resource management and looking after your crew, in this case your dogs. You're not in danger of dying from dysentery or zombie bites in here though. This time your biggest concerns are starving and freezing to death. Those are more pleasant ways to go out, right? Uh, okay, maybe not. The game is divided into two stages, recruitment and the journey itself. Let's talk about the recruitment phase first. Here, you have to inspect the dogs and figure out which ones you want to take with you on your journey. You have eight to choose from, but you can only take four. Chomper is your fifth member, and being your team leader, he can't be replaced. It's important that you pay attention to the quirks of each dog during this phase. For example, Barkley has a reputation for getting into fights and defending his owner against any threat. He'll keep you safe from wolves and other animals on the journey. Since you can only take two hits in this game, bringing Barkley along might end up saving your run. However, there is a chance that he will get injured during the fight, crippling your team until you can heal him the next time you set up camp. And that's not a guarantee, since medkits are rare and you might not always have one available. This is truly the hardest part of the game right here. Getting up close with the dogs is a clever way of immediately pitting the player's love of animals against the part of their brain that makes logical decisions. I mean, how can you say no to these faces? I played through the game twice for the purpose of this review, and on my first save, I recruited every single dog I came across, instantly filling my roster. Needless to say, the logical side of my brain lost that day. Now, onto the gameplay loop. You have limited control over your dogs, aside from giving them directions at junctions and deciding when to explore or make camp. You have four resources that you need to keep track of. Bullets, wood, meat, and medkits. Meat is used to restore your hunger and the dog's energy. Bullets are for hunting, and wood is used to start fires at camp. I don't think I need to explain what a medkit does. You will need to carefully manage both your hunger meter and the dog's stamina in order to survive the journey. Making a turn at a junction costs one bar of stamina, and stopping to explore uses up one of your hunger bars. This can lead to some tense situations later on in the game where you have to decide on whether or not you can actually afford to explore. Maybe you'll find something to hunt, or maybe, for example, you'll get trampled by a moose instead, 
potentially ending your run. But how do you even explore in the first place? While you're storming through the wilderness, you or one of your dogs will occasionally notice something nearby, forcing you to make a split-second decision to investigate. This is how you acquire resources in the game, whether that be by hunting the local wildlife, gathering wood from birch trees, or searching abandoned cabins for tools and bullets. Tools will make your journey a whole lot easier. An axe will let you cut wood from a tree without wasting hunger, and a bear trap can be set while resting at camp to gather food. Speaking of which... Dear God, your eyes are blue. If you want some advice for your first playthrough, I would strongly recommend recruiting Stilton. No offense to Gale and Finn, I love them both, but Stilton is easily one of the most useful dogs in the game. Not only will he lead you to animals more often, but if you let him choose where to set the bear trap, that is, if you have it, you will earn some extra meat. Good choice, Stilton. There are a couple of weasels over there. My first save went swimmingly thanks to Stilton. The bear trap does go on a cooldown after each successful use though, which leads us to the primary hunting mechanic of the game. Hunting requires you to successfully aim and shoot your gun, which is done via a poorly explained quick time event. So here I am, on my first hunt of the first run, wondering what the shooting controls for this game are gonna be like. As my character takes a knee and points her gun, a tip flashes up on the screen. Press E to hold your breath and left click to fire. Yeah, that seems pretty simple. I've played my fair share of Call of Duty, I got this. Seriously? I missed what the f- See all this shit at the bottom of the screen? I thought these were just dramatic effects to heighten the tension of the first kill, since the protagonist is initially uncomfortable with the idea of hunting animals. That was the artsy side of my brain interfering once again. Turns out you're supposed to fire your gun when this little white orb lands in the center of this lens flare, and holding your breath slows it down. I'm surprised that what is arguably the most important mechanic in the game is given such a vague tutorial, especially considering the fact that, up until this point, the game had done a decent job of explaining everything else. It took me about two or three hunts to figure the system out. Once I did, hunting became a breeze, and from that point forward, I never failed the minigame again. Okay, okay, um... Throughout the game, you'll have the option of completing quests for each of the dogs on your team. These vary in length and objectives, with most of them revolving around helping the dogs overcome their fears and shortcomings. For example, you need to teach Barkley to use, well, his bark, rather than charge head first into danger. Okay, how about, um... <laughs> yes, yeah, see, you got it! Okay, let's try it again. Bark! Yes, good. It succeeds in making you become more attached to your team, and I found myself wanting to complete every single mission that popped up. It's satisfying when you finally see one of these quests through to the end, adding to this feeling that you and your dogs have truly grown as a team. Yes! We did it! Vote is ours! <laughs> We're pretty good at this! But how does the game handle its roguelite elements? Well, this is where it stumbles a bit. Before I go on, yes, I did enjoy my first couple of runs, and on the whole, I think I would recommend the game. But at the same time, I found that the Red Lantern lacks that addicting quality that I've enjoyed in other roguelites, and there are a few reasons for that. So let me explain where the roguelite elements come into play. When either you or your dogs bite the dust, you wake up in the van, with the implication that your failed run was a nightmare. Actually, the protagonist flat out says it was just a nightmare. A nightmare. Okay, well, at least I have an idea of what could happen to me out there. It was a nightmare. You'll start your next run with slightly more resources, as well as any tools you found on your last attempt. Not a bad way to maintain your immersion while also getting you back into the action quickly. Here's my issue, though. You know how I mentioned the quest for the dogs earlier? None of your progress towards completing them saves upon death. None of it. Not a thing. This, right here, is where the game's narrative structure and roguelite elements clash. Now, obviously, I understand that repetition is a part of a roguelite's DNA, and in most cases, I'm fine with that. But the problem with the Red Lantern is that, at its core, it's a narrative game first and a roguelite second. 
This is where it differs from the Oregon Trail, with the story in that game basically boiling down to, hey, do you think you could reach safe haven without you and your crew dying from horrible diseases? But no. The Red Lantern has a story with themes and monologues and all that other stuff. It's about finding your place in the wild, becoming one with nature, regaining your confidence, etc. I know this, because I've had to listen to the protagonist repeat the same lines of dialogue over and over again across multiple runs. But she kept going, and her dogs kept going because they wanted to. And she didn't know what was going to come next, but she knew if she was supposed to make it, she would. So she just had to let the pups put one paw in front of the other and trust them to get her to the end. Ashley Birch does a fine job with the material here. That's not my issue. It's just that any emotional impact these monologues might have had at one point quickly gives way to annoyance. Especially when you're on your third or fourth run and just want to concentrate this time. And the endearing moments you have with the dogs during their quest lines are diminished, as you're forced to spam click through them because you've done these parts several times already. Having your progress save upon death will have been perfect, and I'm not sure why that wasn't a feature here. On top of these issues, it's hard to ignore the fact that you've pretty much seen everything the game has to offer after about one or two runs. Considering the fact that roguelites are meant to be highly replayable, this is an issue for me. I'm not sure if the map in this game is randomly generated or not, but if it is, then I certainly didn't notice. On my second save, with the exception of bringing along different dogs, it played out pretty much the same as my first save. I had that tense encounter with the bear again, I saw the large herd of caribou and the frozen deer multiple times. You get the idea. It just needed more variety, that's all. More events and encounters, maybe. Or how about this? Different weather conditions. I was kinda surprised that the game didn't have these to begin with. How cool would it have been to try and seek shelter from an ice storm or navigate your crew through an intense blizzard? Oh, a blizzard, huh? Gee, I wonder where you got that inspired idea from. Hey, can you shut your map? At the very least, give us a new map to venture through after beating the game. Maybe it's more difficult, and maybe you can find new dogs to recruit along the way. See? I would have been all over that. Okay, let me dial it back a bit. As I said earlier, I still mostly enjoyed my second run, and honestly, I'm interested in seeing what this studio does next. But I had no desire to play through the game again afterwards, and I think the price tag is a bit steep for a game that, all saves and runs combined, I put about four and a half hours into. So, now that all that's out of the way, should you play the Red Lantern? As much as I've ragged on it in the second half of this review, I'm still gonna give it a thumbs up, but wait for a sale before picking it up. The Red Lantern's charming premise, colorful visuals, and simple gameplay make for an entertaining ride through the cold, but it lacks the depth and replayability of other roguelites. Your canine companions help liven up the experience, and I fell in love with each of their different quirks and personalities. And don't worry, you can pet them. If that's all you're looking for, then this game will keep you entertained for one or two playthroughs. But if you're looking for the next addicting roguelite to sink your teeth into, you're better off searching elsewhere. Either way, I'd recommend picking it up during a Steam sale. And that's the way the news goes. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope to see you in the next video, which will probably be an old and mostly forgotten on that 2012 Syndicate game or binary domain. I haven't decided yet. Actually, you know what? Leave a comment down below on which one you'd like to see. Ho ho! What a cheeky way to boost viewer engagement under the guise of indecisiveness. You've really taken to this whole YouTuber thing, huh? What's next? A sponsor from a microtransaction-filled mobile game? No, of course not. But have you ever heard of NordVPN? <laughs>